Hi, my name is Daria and I'm a colorist and a DaVinci Resolve master trainer. Today we're going to be looking at some more advanced concepts in DaVinci Resolve's color page. If you've not yet seen the first video in this series, I suggest you check it out so that you're more familiar with some of the core concepts of the color page before following along with this one. But if you feel you're ready, let's jump into it. I've already got my project set up, so this was also a DRA, and I have my timeline open. In this project, I would like to set up color management before I begin color grading. Color management is an internal process in DaVinci Resolve that remaps the starting point of all your clips to a single working color space. So for example, right now you can see I have a series of clips on my timeline, all with different sources and different codecs. Based on these codec names, I can see that some of the clips have come directly from uh, one of our Blackmagic cameras. So these are in the Blackmagic RAW standard, whereas some of the other clips have been transcoded. So we have Apple ProRes and DNxHR, which are some common intermediary codec standards. This means that the way that the color information in these clips is encoded is slightly different. So with color management, we can remap all of these into a single working standard that will allow the color tools in the color page to operate consistently and smoothly, producing nice, beautiful results. Another reason why we use color management is so that we can control our deliverable outputs. So there's a lot of different standards that we deliver to. Uh, for example, cinema projection, television broadcast, online streaming services, and of course the internet. All of these use different transmission technologies or different display standards. And for that reason, we have different color standards to deliver to. If uh, you were grading a non-color managed project, you would have to hypothetically regrade your project for every one of those standards. But with color management enabled, it's enough for you to simply change the output standard that you're delivering to, and automatically all of your grades will be remapped. So let's set this up in the project settings, which you can access via the gear icon in the bottom right corner of the program. I'm going to click once, and then in the sidebar on the left, I'm going to navigate to the color management section. By default, the color science is set to DaVinci YRGB, which is essentially like disabling color management. I am going to select my drop-down list and enable it by selecting DaVinci YRGB color managed. When I do this, I reveal some additional controls. Right now we have a dropdown for Resolve Color Management preset, and it's assuming that I want to deliver for conventional streaming online. You can see a slight description underneath telling you exactly what the standard is used for. If I click on this dropdown, I can see that there's a lot of other standards represented. As I mentioned, things like broadcast and cinema are all covered, as well as SDR and HDR deliverables. I am going to choose a standard that's going to allow me to future-proof my project. Future-proofing means that if something comes up down the line and I need to deliver to a new standard that I hadn't considered, or one that might potentially not even exist yet, I can still do so with this project. The standard is called DaVinci Wide Gamut, and it far exceeds any of the standards uh, currently represented in this list. So I'll pick DaVinci Wide Gamut. And then underneath that, I am being prompted for an output color space. And as you're color grading, this should represent the monitor that you're using for the color grade. In my case, I'm on a color grading monitor set to the Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4 standard. If you're grading on your computer monitor, you might want to check out what standard it currently uses and set your output color space to match. When you're creating deliverables for other standards, for things like broadcast and cinema, you will need to look up what those deliverable requirements are and set the output color space accordingly. The only general rule here is that you want to start with the widest possible gamut and then work your way down as you start creating your deliverables. But in my case, uh, this is the widest standard I need. It's Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4. I'm going to click Save. And in fact, just before I do that, I'm going to move uh, my project settings window out of the way. And I'll keep an eye on the viewer as I do this so I can see the change occur. Right, so hopefully you noticed uh, the color shifted, uh, became a little bit more saturated, there's a touch more contrast. It's starting to look more like real life, so we're not, no longer seeing this like log encoded version of the video clips. Feel free to navigate between these clips using the arrow keys to see that all of the colors have been shifted and all of the clips look uh, closer to each other as well as a starting point. So now I can begin color grading, know that I am within a very safe standard for color grading. All of my tools are going to behave in a consistent manner and I can always change my output color space if I needed to. 
So how does DaVinci Resolve know what the starting point of all your footage is? Sometimes it doesn't know, sometimes it does. For example, when you're working with raw media, any of the raw standards currently supported by DaVinci Resolve will automatically be remapped into the working color space that you've set up. If I go back into my project settings, I can click on the camera raw tab in the sidebar and look at my raw profiles to see all of the different raw standards currently supported. All of these will automatically be remapped. So I don't have to worry about any of the clips that have Blackmagic RAW written under them in the codex. However, for clips that have been transcoded, uh, so Apple ProRes, DNxHR, because of the nature of transcoding, we are losing some of the metadata associated with these clips when they were originally captured. So we don't actually know what the starting point is. Uh, in this case, we would probably have to either look up our camera specs if we were the ones who shot the footage ourselves or get in contact with the camera operator or DP from the project and find out what color standard they shot in. We can then right click on any of the clips on the timeline and make changes to make sure that the input color space of the clips is specified and it matches their origin. So clip number seven, for example, has already been set up. I can navigate to input color space and I can see that this was captured on a Blackmagic Design camera, 4.6K film using the generation one color space. Um, so that has already been set up and remapped. Other times you might decide that you don't want to apply color management on certain clips or certain graphics, for example, in which case you can choose to bypass color management altogether. With this clip, for example, the color management uh, has occurred, but I might find that it's a little extreme around the highlights, uh, which are looking a bit saturated. I can right click on clip number 10 and select bypass color management. And in that case, I go back to that log look, but at least I feel like I have a little bit more control over how I set up uh, my contrast and my saturation from the get-go. The downside of disabling color management though on clips is that if you decide to change your output color space to a different deliverable standard, that clip will not react and it will not be remapped, which means you will have to regrade it. So uh, you should avoid uh, bypassing color management whenever possible. And then finally, if all of your media is originating from the same camera source, it makes sense to set it up in the project settings rather than the individual input color spaces. If I go back to my project settings controls to color management, I will need to return to my color management preset parameter and change it to custom. When I do that, any of the settings associated with DaVinci Wide Gamut will reveal themselves uh, unpacked into all of these individual customizable parameters. So now I can set my input color space into whichever camera standard I wish. But in this case, I'm happy to leave uh, the default settings as they are. I'm gonna click cancel and continue working. The next thing I'd like to take a look at is the node editor. In the first video, uh, we used the node editor primarily for organizing our grades. We had separate nodes for balancing, for creating contrast and looks. But in this video, I'd like to take a closer look at what the node editor can do for us and why node order matters. So I'd like to perform a series of exercises with you and test you on how well you understand the signal flow. Hopefully, when you complete these exercises, you'll develop more confidence in using the node editor and understanding how to break up the different stages of your color grading process. I have clip number one selected, and the first thing I would like to do is turn this into a black and white image. If you've already used the primaries palette and the adjustment controls, you'll be familiar with the saturation parameter, so you know that it's enough to drag that down to zero or just select the numeric field and type zero in order to produce a black and white image. But I have another way of doing this that I prefer. So I will double click the saturation parameter to reset it. And I will go to a different palette in the left palettes called the RGB mixer. In this palette, I'm able to instantly turn this image black and white by navigating down to the monochrome parameter and clicking the checkbox. I now have a black and white image, but I also have some additional control over the individual red, green, and blue channel strengths. I can drag these color bars and increase the intensity of the red channel, for example, which will elevate things like skin tones or anything that's got uh, earthy or brown colors. Or I could do the same thing for my green output. This will affect natural elements like trees. 
And then finally, I can also do the same thing for the blue channel, which tends to affect things like skies and water. I will reset green and blue and just leave my red channel elevated so that I have a slightly brighter image than I had originally. I will label this node, call this black and white to VW, and then create a new serial. So far, we've been using the contextual menu to add new serial corrector nodes, but I can also use a shortcut, which is Option S on a Mac or Alt S on a PC. So that's a nice quick way uh, to generate new corrector nodes. And this node I will use to turn the image into a sepia tone. The sepia is kind of like a reddish brown tone that's uh, most commonly associated with older photography. So I'll give it a label in the node editor, return back to my color wheels, and I'm going to drag the gamma wheel towards this orangey red until I get that exact look. All right, so this is the first question I'd like to ask you, the first test. What will happen if I switched the order of those two nodes? Will it make a difference? And what will we end up seeing in the viewer? If we follow the video signal from left to right, we can read the first node as being the RGB input. This is where the original video signal enters. We travel to the right. You can see there's an entrance arrow to the black and white node where the image gets turned black and white. The signal then continues into the sepia node where we then turn it into this orangey red. Finally, the signal continues into the RGB output, which is what we end up seeing in the viewer. So the order does matter, but what will happen visually right now if I change the order of these two around? There's a couple of ways to accomplish this. Uh, one way you should know about is being able to extract the node from the connection line. I'm going to select the node, press E on my keyboard, E for extract. The node pops off and I can now move my black and white to the side and make room to place the sepia tone over there. When I drop it off, I will see the result in the viewer. And if anyone was thinking to themselves, ah, the image will definitely be black and white because that's the very last action that we perform, then you were right. But does that mean that the sepia node didn't matter at all since it's essentially being overwritten by the black and white? Well, no, not necessarily. Remember, we were using the sepia node in order to increase the amount of warmth in the image. And when we were working in the RGB mixer, we specifically increased the red channel strength. That makes this node particularly sensitive to reds. If I disable the sepia node right now by clicking on its number, this will have an impact on the way that the black and white image looks. And in fact, if I go back to sepia, back to that gamma wheel and start to move it around, I will continue to have an impact on the black and white node. So hopefully this small exercise demonstrated that node order absolutely does matter and nodes always impact one another, even if it's not immediately obvious. I'm going to reset my node editor by right-clicking in an empty area of the node graph and choosing Reset All Grades and Nodes. So let's take a closer look at a single corrector node's anatomy. You'll see that there are two inputs and two outputs. At the top, the green input and output carry the video's RGB data. So that is the actual pixel information, red, green, and blue pixel values. Underneath that, you have the blue uh, or key input and output. This will carry all of your key or mat data. So for example, if you're using power windows or qualifiers or even external mats, you can reuse this data using these blue input and output signals. For the next exercise, I'd like to take a look at destructive workflows. So the very first thing I'm gonna do on this clip is to completely crush the shadows to imitate um, you know, setting up a very harsh contrast at the beginning of your workflow. I will, uh, first of all, label this node. I'll call it lift, because I will be adjusting the lift master wheel. I'll go into my primaries colors and I will drag the master wheel to the left, down, 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 a lot lower than I would normally ever do in an actual grade. There we go. So it's nice and crushed. You can see a lot of the data in the image has disappeared. We can virtually just only see the sky and uh, this outline of our model's face. Everything else, if I disable this node, you can see has disappeared. 
If you look in the scopes, you will also witness the waveform also being crushed towards uh, the very bottom here against the black point. All right, so all of that is gone. I am going to create another corrector node, Option S or Alt S. And then I would like to approach you with a second question. Can we restore this video signal? All of that data that we just crushed in the shadows. And to add a layer of difficulty, uh, I would like to ask if we can restore it using another tool other than the lift master wheel. So for example, the curves. I will name my node accordingly while you think it over. And then we'll take a look. I'm going to drag my mouse over to the curves here, create a new point, drag upwards. And at first, it certainly does feel like we have fallen into a destructive workflow. As I try to brighten this image, I will find that uh, I'm not able to restore the data or to improve it. In fact, I appear to be distorting it even further, right? Because we're increasing the saturation, we're blowing it out, um, and we're not getting any of that data back in the shadows. If I look in the scopes, I also feel that the bottom of the waveform is permanently stuck to the floor. All right, well, the thing is, the reason this is happening is because I'm targeting the wrong tonal range uh, for this image. Because when we crushed it using the lift, uh, the lift primarily goes after the black point of the image and then linearly tapers off and affects uh, the rest of the waveform. What we're targeting by dragging the middle of our curve is more in the gamma range. So I'm going to right click on this control point to reset it, go down here towards the black point of the curve, and drag upwards. And here you can see we have been able to restore the image. Uh, the waveform is restored in the scopes, so all of that fine data, all of those shapes, they're no longer flat. And as I keep dragging it up, I can see that everything looks really clean um, back in the image. So if I drag it to roughly the same position, you know, to counteract that negative 20, I can get back all the details. If I press Shift D, I can bypass the entire pipeline and see the results. So if I just get it a little bit darker, then you can't even tell the difference when I bypass. So it's almost like the lift uh, crushing had no effect. So does that mean you should feel comfortable crushing your shadows or establishing a really intense contrast very early on in your pipeline? No, not necessarily. Even though this exercise proved that digital media cannot really be destroyed within the pipeline, um, it also shows that we can accidentally end up falling into these workflows where we could lose track of our shadows or our highlights and not be able to restore them. Because we don't always know how to perfectly counteract something that we did in an earlier node. I wouldn't, for example, only use uh, the lift master wheel to establish contrast. I would also use the contrast and pivot uh, controls. I might use the shadow parameter in the adjustment controls, could use the log wheels. And if three or four nodes down the pipeline, I decide that my shadows are looking a little bit bunched up or a little bit too dark, when I try to restore that, there's not going to be a single control point or parameter that I can use. Chances are it will remain kind of clumped together. And in that case, I truly am working in a destructive workflow. Um, so it's not really about the digital media failing me so much as it is my treatment of the video signal that's just been too aggressive. This is why it's usually suggested to leave all of your creative color grading and all of your looks towards uh, the very tail end of your workflow or the end of the pipeline and use the first few notes to do the opposite, to clean up your video signal as much as possible in preparation for the grade. In the final exercise, I want to take a look at some of the more subtle effects of node order. So I'll go back to this image. Uh, once again, right click in the node editor and reset all grades and nodes. In the first node, I will establish contrast. Nothing too dramatic. Uh, I'm going to go into my adjustment controls, drag the contrast parameter until I get a nice bold contrast. I really want to emphasize uh, the sunset coming in from the side here on the frame. Uh, but I'll, I'll also use the pivot to brighten up the image slightly so that we can still see the details on our face. All right, and that looks really, really nice. I'll press Command D to disable my contrast node, compare before and after. And I think that's really good for establishing a look. I'll then create a new serial node, it's option S, and this will be my look. I'll keep it extremely simple. I'll use the offset color wheel to introduce a bit of blue to the image. And as I start dragging towards blue, 
Before the image even starts turning blue, it actually goes neutral. And that makes sense, right? Because the opposite of blue is yellow, and this is a predominantly very, very warm image. So as I start to drag towards blue on this color wheel, I get this really nice neutral tone, and then I could take it a little bit further if I do in fact want this nice cool look. All right, so I'll take it about as far as that, not too dramatic. And my final question, my final test for you is, what will happen if I was to switch the order of these two around? Will it be better? Will it be worse? Will it make a difference? I can switch the order in the same way that I did previously by using the extract shortcut, uh, but there's even a faster way to switch the order of nodes, and that is to hold down the command key on a Mac or the control key on a PC, and as you're holding it, to pick up the node and drag it to its new position. And then you'll see that look and contrast have switched sides, and the image has been substantially affected in the viewer. So again, node order matters. But to answer the question of whether it's better or worse is impossible, because all that it is is different. The way that uh, the look node has affected the image has changed because it was not as contrasted. Instead, we've applied look to a flatter version of this image, which means that the blue was uniform, and then we used contrast in a later node to push the differences and enhance the saturation of the image, and that means enhancing the blue. To compare the two images, I'm going to grab a still of this second look. And then I'll press Command-Z to go back to my previous setup, which was contrast first, followed by look. I'll double-click the still in the gallery, and I can either drag the wipe line back and forth to compare the two looks, or I can even drag the wipe all the way to the left of the frame so that I'm completely filling up the viewer, and then click the wipe button in the top left corner to turn it on and off. If you're still getting used to color grading and uh, you're experimenting, it's a good idea to do this occasionally, to switch nodes around, to really gain an understanding of how video signals work and how they get treated, and over time gain more confidence about where you should be placing your nodes in your pipeline to produce an optimal look. The next thing we'll be looking at is some raw media, how to set it up and how to color grade it using the HDR palette. Clip number two, as you can probably see from the codec title here, is a Blackmagic RAW clip. It's got quite a wide dynamic range. You can see there's a sky in the background and then characters in the foreground. I am going to navigate to the Camera RAW palette on the very left of the page, and I can use this palette to set up exactly how the image is debayered. So that means how the original RAW signal is treated by DaVinci Resolve and then output to us in the color standard that we have set up in color management. Because this is a RAW signal, I have a lot of control over its final appearance. A lot of these settings in other camera standards are baked in upon capture, so things like ISO and exposure, uh, temperature. With RAW signals, you're able to change them after the fact. Right now, the ISO is set to 400, but because of how bright the image is and because the, a lot of the sky is getting blown out, I'd like to lower that uh, to, say, about 100 ISO. Now, even though the foreground has become a much darker, I've now revealed a lot more potential for the sky at the top. However, if I look at my scopes, I'll find that a lot of the sky data looks clipped, which is quite unusual for raw media because it does capture so many stops of light, it's actually very difficult to clip any information. The reason why the very top of that waveform appears flat is because it hasn't yet been debayered. So we can select Highlight Recovery at the bottom of the Camera Raw palette to perform that final debayering stage. Now this makes it a little bit more processor intensive, but of course gives us a more accurate result in the image. Hopefully when you clicked on this checkbox, you noticed that a lot of the detail in the clouds have come back in the sky. So I'll turn it off again so you can see before and after it's gone from having a really flat gray look to being much more pronounced, and it's gonna be much easier to work with when we start uh, working with the HDR palette, uh, which I would now like to switch to. The HDR palette is located right next to the primary wheels, but it offers you far, far more control over the individual tonal ranges of the image. So right now the layout looks uh, quite similar. We have three wheels on the left with one uh, global on the right, which is similar to the offset. 
But then at the top of the palette, I also have these banking controls that allow me to navigate across some additional tonal ranges that we have. By default, uh, the HDR palette comes with six tonal ranges. On the left, we have the dark zones. So from broadest to most narrow, it's shadow, dark, and black. And then on the right-hand side, I have my light zones, which is from broadest light, highlight, and specular. I can see how these tonal ranges affect the image by jumping into the zones graph. So I can navigate to that uh, using this button in the top right corner of the HDR palette. And here I can see a list of these tonal zones on the left-hand side. And when I select a zone, I can see the direction that it travels in. So this is the section of the image that it affects. In this case, it's affecting the midtones to lower midtones to shadows followed by the dark, which has a narrower range, followed by black, which is essentially going after the super blacks of the image. And then in reverse, we have the light zone, which has a great deal of overlap with the shadow zone, so two stops worth, and then continues toward highlight and then specular for the very brightest portions of the image. With this distribution, I am able to create more intricate grading changes to the image. I could target the shadows separately from the midtones, unlike the primaries color wheels in which I have a great deal of overlap all across the board. By the way, the HDR palette is not limited to just raw media. Um, you can select any standard dynamic range clip and it will automatically map its operation to that tonal range. So we'll continue to behave consistently and produce perceptually uniform results. But in the case of this clip, let's start creating a grade. I'll begin with the global wheel, which is going to impact the overall image. I'll drag the exposure to brighten it up. So my focus, of course, is going to be the foreground, which is where we can see the people. That's always the priority in any grade. But then I will also want to rescue some of that information in the highlights at the very top. That's the whole point of shooting RAW is that, you know, we're able to retain all of this data. Uh, but right now, I don't really have a lot of room uh, in which to expand this information. Right now, the entire sky and all its clouds are at the very top of my scopes. So the first thing I need to do is bring those a little bit lower. I'm going to target the highlight range, click on the exposure controls, and drag to the left to darken that section. Okay, so now that I've given myself a little bit more room in the scopes, I can go for the more narrow specular range to drag the very tops of the waveform upwards, thereby creating contrast in the clouds and enhancing the details. All right, wonderful. And because both the highlight and the specular ranges overlap the broader light zone, which is on the left-hand side, I can continue to determine how bright or dark I want the sky to be by adjusting the exposure uh, of the light range while still maintaining the detail that I've just recovered in the clouds. And then I can also choose to, for example, drag the control point of the light zone to introduce a bit of color into that range. So I'm going to pick it up and drag it slightly towards blue to cool the sky down and give it more of a daylight, a daytime look. All right, so with the global controls set up with my highlights recovered, I can now navigate or bank to my dark zone and do the same thing for the shadows. I would just like to brighten up uh, the foreground elements a little bit. So I'll go for the broadest shadow zone, increase the exposure. I would also like to make it a little bit more saturated, so really reveal the colors uh, in the greenery around our characters and on their clothes. I'm going to click and drag the saturation parameter. And now I can use the dark and black zones to create a bit of contrast by darkening the lower midtones and shadows in this image. So I'll change the exposure, a little bit drag it to the left. And then with the black zone, I'm just going for the extra darks. So this is going to be the darkest shadows in the wrinkles in their clothes, in the spaces between the branches and the bushes. All right, and that's given the image a little bit more depth. You'll notice that all of the tonal ranges have a couple of sliders around them. These determine the position of the tonal range, so the cutoff point. You're able to change that position to, and determine exactly how broad or narrow any uh, zone is. 
Before you start adjusting these, you probably want to check exactly what is being targeted by any particular zone. So as well as using the Zone Graphs palette, I can also click and hold the icon next to the zone name that will display to me what exactly I'm affecting when I make changes you know, to these color wheels and their parameters, their exposure and saturation. So as you can see, um, when I travel from black to dark, the range gets broader and broader. It might be a little bit easier to make adjustments if you can permanently see what that highlight looks like. Thankfully, you can enable highlight mode and that will display the last zone that you were affecting or impacting. So let's click on the highlight tool in the top left corner of the viewer. And it's currently showing me my black zone, but I would like to see where my light range is. So I will go into the light wheel, make a slight adjustment to its tonal range, and you can see that by default, it actually covered a pretty wide section. So not just the sky, but also the mountaintops, the trees, and also that rock in the foreground, which was a little bit lighter than some of the other shadows. So I can drag this slider upwards to just remove all of those foreground elements and make sure that the light region stays focused on the sky. That way, when I you know, make my changes in terms of uh, exposure or in terms of color, it's not then affecting the rest of the scene. When I'm done, I can disable highlight mode and see the end result. And I can press Command D to compare my image before and after. And hopefully you can see that we've been able to restore a lot of the data at the top of the image. We've also made sure that the image in front of us is nice and clean and saturated and easy to see. The next tool we'll be taking a look at is the magic mask. I'm going to click on clip number three, which has already been balanced. And I'll make a new node with the intention of working on the runner in this shot. So I'm going to press Option S. And usually using other secondary selection tools, I would have to spend a lot of time selecting either the overall shape of the runner or maybe even targeting her limbs and her torso individually, uh, tracking it across the frame. So pretty time consuming processes. But instead, I can also use the magic mask. This is a tool that's designed to recognize people or features in a shot and automatically track them for you in order to perform color grading or any kind of effects that you want to apply. A magic mask can be found in the central palettes. There it is. A pretty straightforward interface. We have some selections in the top left corner that allow us to select either people or features, and then analysis controls running across the top. Because we are trying to track the runner, I'm going to leave person selected, and I need to first indicate to the Magic Mask palette where my person is. So I will go to the viewer, and I will click and drag to create a small line called a stroke on my runner. You want to keep these strokes quite short so that uh, when the tracking begins, uh, it's able to follow along with the person. If you have a long stroke, then it's more likely to separate from the person that it's following and maybe grow and sort of float off. I will now go back to the Magic Mask palette. And first of all, I want to review what this selection looks like. So I'm going to select Toggle Mask Overlay. There we go. And that is a very good starting point. So Magic Mask has been intelligent enough to recognize not just her torso and her head, but also the fact that she's got her arms uh, around her, even though they're folded, and even her hair. I can now start the analysis process at the very top of the palette, Analyze Forward. This looks a little bit like the Tracker Palette Analysis Tools. And you can see that as she runs forward, her body is recognized, her legs as they move, and even her folded arms. And what's also particularly impressive is that as she passes foreground objects, the mask disappears in those areas. And that's really important when we're color grading, right? Because we don't want a set of legs, you know, a grade in the shape of legs covering our foreground objects. So ideally, you know, there shouldn't be a grade there. And the magic mask is able to recognize that. Now, on the right-hand side of the Magic Mask palette, we have a few finesse controls. These are very similar to the matte finesse uh, controls that you will find in the Qualifier palette. These allow us to further clean up our selection. The ones to really pay attention to is the quality in the top left corner. 
This allows you to switch between making a selection that's relatively processor non-intensive, but less accurate, like this one, so it's more of a soft bubble around the person, versus better, which will give you something that's a little bit tighter around the body, a little bit more accurate, but will require more processing power. So I can click on better right now just to review what this will be like. And you should have seen that change instantly in the viewer. There's no longer this like soft edge around uh, the runner. And if I was to drag this backwards, the analysis continues. You could see that the selection is accurate around her hair and her legs. But in my case, I'm gonna stick to faster because I don't really need that uh, level of accuracy. So as soon as I click that, you could see there's a few more bubbles. Um, something that will help me, by the way, with that edge is the Smart Refine tool. Smart Refine on the surface looks like a standard in and out ratio tool, right? Something that will expand or collapse your mat. Uh, but in this case, Smart Refine also takes into account the result of the magic mask analysis, right? So it knows that it's looking at a person and it will expand and collapse based on how confident it is uh, in its selection. So if there's like a, a little bubble right in front of her fist, then it might not be super confident that that is a person. And that would be the first area of the mask that's reduced as you start to drag Smart Refine. So I'm going to do that. I'll click and drag to the right, and that will give me a cleaner selection. Another parameter that it's a good idea to use is the blur radius. So that will soften the edges of your color grade after you start to apply it. I will click on the numeric field to the right of the blur radius, and I will type in a value of 20, for example. And now I'm ready to disable the mask overlay and start my color grade. I can still see the stroke in the viewer, which I can disable by going into my options. Or I can simply go to a different palette in the color page, and then that will automatically hide any overlays I had in the magic mask. Uh, however, the magic mask selection is still in place, so I can still continue grading. I am going to brighten up uh, my runner, try to get her to pop out of this environment, which is already uh, you know, very saturated, very rich. I'll go back to the primaries palette and use the Gamma Master Wheel to make her a little bit brighter. I'll also use Color Boost. And then I can also use the Contrast Control to also make her a little bit more bold. So when I press Command-D to disable the node, you can see that it's a subtle change, but she is looking a little bit more pronounced, a little bit more uh, golden in this environment. I can now press Playback, and with the color grade already applied to the Magic Mask, I'll be able to see the result throughout the entire video. If I pause at any point, I can continue to press Command-D to compare before and after. All right, and you can see that it's a nice, quick way to enhance uh, a person in a shot. Or I can do the inverse. Let me reset uh, my primaries palette and go back to the magic mask so that instead of affecting our runner, I am actually inverting the mask using the toggle switch next to the mask overlay. I am instead affecting the environment around her. I will hide the mask overlay, return to my controls, and do something as simple as setting my saturation parameter to zero. Now I have a runner who's in full color running in a black and white world. I can play this back. And that took me just a couple of minutes to set up. Again, trying to do this manually um, using windows or uh, external mats could take substantially more time, not just minutes, but even hours. Uh, so the Magic Mask is really quite wonderful for these types of um, color grade setups. Another thing that we can use the Magic Mask for is also tracking individual features. In this next clip, I have a character entering a dark environment. And with uncontrolled lighting, sometimes you'll have situations where your subjects are a little underlit. So I would like to use the magic mask uh, to isolate his face and brighten that up. I am going to jump to the very beginning of this clip, open up magic mask, and this time instead of using person, I'll select features and I will find a drop-down menu on the left-hand side that allows me to select particular features. I'm going to begin with face. I'll navigate to the viewer, and once again, I'll make a small stroke to indicate where the face is. I can enable the mask overlay in the palette to see my initial result. 
You'll notice that the neck is not included in the selection, so usually the face is qualified as anything that goes up to the chin. To select someone's neck as well, I will need to go to my drop-down menu and choose Torso Exposed Skin. And then make a second selection on his neck. All right, and now I have a full selection of his skin tones, and I'm able to perform a track. All right, perfect. That was a fairly clean result. Um, I will like to tighten up the edges of this mat once again, so I'll go to my Smart Refine Controls, select the numeric value, and enter a higher value to uh, pull in this selection. And once again, I'm going to blur the radius to make sure that uh, my grade does not appear too sharp around his face. And now I can jump back to my primary grading controls and ever so slightly brighten his face in this environment. And maybe also push up the colors just a touch, the color boost, so that it's not looking too flat. Now when I press Command-D, I can compare my before and after. I always use the disable function to see if I've gone beyond realism, you know, if it's starting to look too artificial. But in this case, you know, whether it's off or whether it's on, it still looks pretty natural to me. And now I can play back this clip to check how it looks throughout. So I'm pretty happy with this result. It looks natural when he's in light and also when he's in shadow. The next tool I'd like to take a look at is the Color Warper. I'm going to navigate to clip number 5 on my timeline, and I'll find the Color Warper right next to the Curves palette. The way the Warper works is very similar to the Curves, but whereas with the HSL Curves we're limited to moving our parameters in a 2D space, just up and down, with the Color Warper you're able to make changes to two parameters at the same time. Uh, so I've got the palette open right now, and I would like to pop it out of this environment to give myself a bit more control. We have an expansion arrow in the top right corner, which I can click to get a much larger overview of this interface, but I can continue to resize it using the bottom right corner of the palette to reshape it, and then use the header of the palette to reposition it where I want it to go. There's two ways of interacting with the Color Warper. You can click and drag the control points that are already on the grid, or you can maneuver to the viewer and click directly in the viewer to interact uh, with the grid. So by default, when you open up the Color Warper, you end up working on the hue and saturation parameters. For example, I can click on the trees in the viewer, and then I can start to drag to the left to saturate that green tone, or drag to the right to desaturate. Notice that the control point in the Color Warper grid is reacting to my adjustments as I hold my mouse and I move it around. So that selection is uh, the color range that I've selected. If I drag downwards, I start to also rotate the hue. And then I can continue to go outwards for more saturation or inwards for less. And that's really the power of the warper, you know, whereas with the HSL curves, I would have to jump between two very different distinct curves to accomplish this look. With a color warper, I can essentially just go by, by feel and also go by what I'm seeing in the viewer and drop off my control point when I feel I'm ready to. In this case, uh, maybe we're going a little bit more abstract. So instead of emphasizing the greenness of this environment, I'm instead going to try to make it look quite dry, uh, but also quite vibrant. So I will move towards an orange tone and then drag it slightly upwards and then release my mouse to drop off the control point. When I continue to move over the viewer, you might notice that uh, there's a lot of activity happening in the Color Warper. So first of all, you see this red cross jumping around, which is representing the color values that I'm currently hovering over with my mouse. So it's telling me exactly what shade of blue or green I'm currently over. But then there's also this yellow box that jumps around to indicate the closest control point to the area that I am hovering over. And that's letting me know which control point I'll be dragging if I start to click and drag in the viewer. With this very low set of divisions in the Color Warper, it can be quite difficult to make an accurate selection and adjustment. 
So I can navigate to the bottom left corner and I will find a division amount for my rings and for my columns. I'm going to click and change this division to a higher number, like 12. By default, the two parameters are linked. So when I choose 12, I am gonna now have 12 divisions for both the rings and columns, and a little bit more precision, especially when it comes to the blue sections of this image. Because when I hover over it, you can now see that the area of blue uh, represented by the vector scope trace in the background now has a column directly over it. So I can click and drag to target these mountains and the sky all in one go. But what if we wanted to affect the mountains without affecting the sky in the image? Uh, in that case, we will need to lock off a section of our column to make sure that not everything within the color warper grid is being affected. I'm going to reset this one control point by right-clicking on it. And then I would like to go back to the viewer in order to analyze exactly what part of the grid affects the sky. And when I do this, I'll find that the yellow box mostly falls on that second point in the blue column. So what I would like to do is lock it in place so that it will not be affected by any future changes in this region. Uh, to do that, I will navigate to the toolbar on the right-hand side, and a button allows me to convert a selected point to a pin. When I click on that, uh, the pin adopts a dark outline, meaning that it's locked in place. This, by the way, also happened to our previous point where we changed the color of this tree. Uh, when you make a change, automatically a control point locks in place so that no future changes happen to that particular region. But now with the blues, I can return to the mountain and click and drag to make a change. And with the sky locked in place, that will no longer be affected as dramatically. I can then click in the top left corner to collapse my color warper, and I'm all done. I'd also like to draw your attention to the collection of resolve effects that come with the software when you first download it. I'll go into a new clip, number six, and launch the open effects library by clicking in the top right corner. Here you will find dozens upon dozens of effects, all under different categories that you can navigate and add to your nodes. There's also a search field at the top in case you don't know exactly which category your effect is in. You can start typing and the effect will filter itself out. So in this case, I'd like to check out the tilt shift blur. This is a type of effect that imitates the look of a tilt shift lens, which has multiple focal points. It's a really nice way of drawing the audience's eye or drawing their attention to a particular subject. In this case, I'm going to pick up the effect, drag and drop it over the node in the editor, and you'll see how the top and bottom of the image have gone out of focus, seemingly. So it's a type of blur. I can use the settings on the right-hand side to enable the depth map preview, which allows me to see exactly which area is in focus, which is uh, anything that's black, and what is out of focus. Uh, so those are the white areas. I am going to change my focus sweep so that it's a little bit higher. I want to make sure that our character who's walking into the building is fully in focus, but then also change the in focus range to make sure it is definitely focusing on him. And then finally, I can use the near blur and far blur controls to indicate exactly how blurry I want the bottom of the frame to be and the top. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of blur. I want to keep it semi-realistic, but I do want it to feel almost dreamy, you know, like we're draw being drawn to the center of the frame. Very good. And I can press Command F to full screen the image and play back the clip. OpenFX allows you to do quite a lot uh, to your clips. So some of these are visual-based, some of them are effect-based. Uh, there's a lot of blur functions, a lot of corrective uh, type of effects. Um, and what's great also is that they don't have to just live in the nodes on their own. You can combine them with other techniques in the color page, including using uh, the primaries tools and even the secondaries. So for example, in a clip like number seven, I could choose to hide someone's identity by applying a blur effect, but then isolating it with a power window. Let me create a brand new node 
option S. And I'll begin by first uh, creating the window and tracking it. I'll activate the circle preset, reshape it, resize it to the man's head. Then move to the tracker palette and analyze forward. There we go. I'm also going to expand uh, the size of my viewer so we can see this a little bit better. So you can see that the window track was successful. It was very, very quick. And now I can go back to my open effects uh, palette and I can choose something like the mosaic blur, drag and drop it onto my node. And it's already isolated by that power window, which is already tracked. So I can play it back and the mosaic blur follows with my subject's head. One of the last things I'd like to touch upon is how to save your grades for future use and also how to share your grades with collaborators. We've created a look on clip number one and I would like to transfer it to a different clip on the timeline. So you can see that clip number eight has a very similar feel. Uh, it's the same environment, it's the same subject. So it should be a pretty straightforward process. Let's see, I'll select clip number one. I will right click to grab a still. And I can click under it to give it a name so I can keep track of what this still contains. I'm then going to click on clip number eight. And I'll also collapse my open effects panel to give myself a bit more room in the node editor. To apply a still or grade, it's enough to right click on the still and choose apply grade. You can also middle click a still to apply a grade as so if you have a mouse with a scroll wheel, it's the fastest way to do it. However, when I applied this grade, uh, I'll notice that the color doesn't quite match. So if you look at clip number one, uh, the blue is quite soft, it's quite subtle. There's not a lot of saturation in this image. Whereas in clip number eight, everything seems a lot more pronounced. Uh, the contrast is more intense, the colors are a bit brighter. So it feels like uh, we weren't really able to successfully reuse this grade. But if you watch the first video in this series, you'll know how important it is to match clips before you start to share grades across them. And before I applied this look, I already had a match node in place. I'm going to return to clip number eight and I'll press Command Z to take a couple of steps back and find my original match node. If I disable this node, I can see that uh, my image was a little bit darker to begin with, a bit more low contrast, and it's been graded to match the starting point of clip number one on the timeline. So what we want to do is add the blue look after this node and not to replace it. To do that, I have to, once again, right click my still, but instead of apply grade, I'm going to choose append node graph. So this will append the entire grade or the entire node structure that was saved in that still. This is still not a perfect match, but I can see now that I have my contrast that's been separately added after the match within the look node following. I don't need the contrast because that was generated for clip number one, right? It's specific to this environment and to this look. So I will select it and press backspace on my keyboard to delete it. Now I have a match node that was designed to imitate the look of clip number one, followed by that very distinct blue look that we created. And now when I compare these two clips, you can see that they're much, much closer in appearance. So now uh, the blue look is uh, once again quite soft, and we also have lower saturation in both cases. Also the tone of our subject's face, her skin tone is looking very similar in the shadows. Uh, we are of course seeing a slightly different side of her, so there's more of a highlight, but that all seems to match up uh, quite well in terms of color. So as you can see, copying grades between clips is pretty straightforward. You just have to make sure that you're not overwriting your match nodes or any steps that you took to make sure that the starting point of your clips are the same. And in this case, it was important not to just apply the whole grade, but rather to append it in order to preserve what you already had. Something else that's important to know uh, what to do in DaVinci Resolve is being able to export and import grades in case you're working with collaborators. I'll start by exporting a grade that we created on clip number two. This was our HDR look. I have to begin by creating a still first. So right click in the viewer, grab still, and then I need to right click the still in the gallery and choose export. 
I will place this on the desktop and I'll give it a name like HDR Mountain. Then I'll click Export and then I'll see what it looks like on the desktop. All right, so I've opened up my Finder window and I can see that the HDR Mountain grade has actually been saved as two separate files, a .dpx and .drx. You need both of these in order to share your grade with someone else. The DPX represents the visual component, so the still frame that you've grabbed uh, that we see in the viewer, whereas the .drx represents the node pipeline in the node editor, right? So it's the metadata of the color grade. Uh, so of course you need that in order to share the grade, but the DRX doesn't really travel on its own. It will always piggyback on the DPX, so you have to send them both. But how would one import uh, this set of files? I've already generated a still that I've shared in the DRA that you would have downloaded for this project. So if you go back to DaVinci Resolve and right-click in the gallery, you can choose Import. And then navigate to the part2.dra folder that you would have used to restore this project. You will find that within this DRA is a stills folder. And within that is a grade called Drama Sky which is also broken up into DPX and DRX. Now, depending on your operating system, depending on how your Finder or Explorer window is set up, you might not even see the DRX file, or it might be grayed out. Uh, and that's perfectly fine because you don't really need to interact with it. It's enough to just select the DPX file and click Import. And as I've mentioned, the DRX really does piggyback off that DPX. It will come with it. Um, I now see a still in my gallery, and this is pertaining to clip number nine. Hopefully you can uh, recognize that. So if you select clip number nine, you can right click the still, apply grade, and now we've carried across that entire grade. So this was made up of a balance, a contrast, and even two secondary grades for the sky and the ground. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this overview of DaVinci Resolve's color page. If you have any remaining questions or if you'd like some advice, please do join us on the Blackmagic Design Forum. And also, if you'd like to check out some of the other training materials in our series on DaVinci Resolve, please go to our training page where you can download our books and take a certification exam.